Looks like we are live. We're welcoming back to the show, Mr. Wes Schneider, the editor in chief. You're still editor in chief, right? You're not senior Thanks, editor bro. of the kingdom or something. Titles no. seem to be changing rapidly. <laughs> yeah, right. But no, editor in chief here at Paizo. Yep. All right, editor in chief at Paizo. We last had Wes on. I think it was last year around Halloween, specifically to talk about having horror in your games. Uh, we're getting a little bit more specific this year, and we're talking about Lovecraft horror. The, this is for a few reasons. One of them's personal. We're starting book four of Carrying Crown in my home game, and that's the Lovecraft-inspired one. Uh, but also, recently on the podcast, I mentioned how I don't really actually know anything about the literary origins of Cthulhu. I just know him as a pop culture figure. So, Wes, you and I just happened to be chatting. You mentioned you'd love to come on and talk about something creepy. Everything seemed to work out well. So, welcome back, sir. Yay! Thanks, Fred. All right, so uh, before we get into Lovecraft, let's talk about Schneider. What uh, what have you been up to lately? Uh, it's been kind of just a blur since Gen Con. Um, we uh, have been really jamming on a lot of the stuff for our early 2004 uh, schedule here. Um, so a lot of cool stuff that we've either already announced that for the, the beginning of next year or are still trying to keep a secret. But, I mean, the, the big thing that just hit my desk, as I was just talking to Ryan about, was uh, we just got our desk copies of the Siri 4 in here, which actually syncs up with our conversation really well because I end up being the guy that puts together a lot of the initial monster lists for these since I'm kind of a monster fanatic. Um, and uh, this thing's really deep with Lovecraft stuff. So uh, don't be surprised if I, I mention a few things about that uh, during the conversation here. But busy, busy. Yeah, you know, when we were setting up this interview, it was like, you know, Wes is the kind of guy that'll come on just to talk. Whereas if I want to get Jason on, i got to make sure there's a hard cover he can talk about. He's got something personal to him. And yet, as it ends up, Bestiary 4 perfectly fits in as a plug for this uh, from this episode. <laughs> Try not to pimp it too hard. <laughs> All right. Well, then, uh, you said there's a lot of Lovecraft in Bestiary 4. Why is that? What is it about Lovecraft that... Well, actually, let's go right to the start. Who is Lovecraft? So, Howard Phillips Lovecraft uh, was a author who was writing at the turn of the last century. Um, was born in 1890 and was working up until 1934. Um, this was a guy who was really inspired by... Um, you know, the writings of Edgar Allan Poe, a lot of the, the dark fiction of, like, Algernon Blackwood and um, uh, Robert Chambers, and just a, a lot of the folks who have done, like, the really creepy gothic stuff of the uh, past century. He's writing during a time of, like, such cultural revolution and um, scientific revolution that it just seems like every other day, week, month, there's some new discovery or some new f new features, some new, just just some new incredible thing that didn't exist before. Um, and while all of that's fascinating, at the same time, there's a lot of scary elements to that. And historically, we remember um, there was this innovation, there was this innovation, there was this. Um, but at the time, just like we have today, there must have been just like some utterly terrifying elements to it. That is something that Lovecraft really ended up glomming onto. Is like we don't know what's, we don't have a perfect perception of the world. In fact, many of our perceptions are um, being proven to be totally false. We thought we were really masters of where we live uh, and, and the world around us, but it's being revealed to us just every day that we don't know anything. Um, and that's something that he really grabbed onto. Um, he ended up writing a lot for the pulps during that time, so like uh, amazing stories and weird tales and so on and so forth, and really established a new genre of horror um, that he often ended up referring to um, as either cosmic horror or um, just weird fiction. Um, and it had so much more to do with, with not like here's these barbarians, or there's these, like, kind of folklore dragons, but these more mysterious things, these more unspeakable things, um, which had really never been seen before, and really, even though at the time, we're not, like, 
lit on fire. Like, we're not lighting the, the fiction world on fire. I mean, in, in fact, Lovecraft, for most of his days, was, was poor and really, um, from a lot of his correspondence, a, a pretty sour, cynical guy. Um, over the last, you know, the, the following century, um, folks have not only retained his work and kept it in publication, but have really, like, glommed onto it and, and have, uh, ex has expanded the following for it. So now he's, um, I can't say that he's quite a household name yet, um, but you're starting to see him, like, even taught in schools increasingly so. Oh, really? I've never heard him taught in schools. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we're like not going to gonna get it like you're like an Edgar Allan Poe or um, um, like a, a, a Fitzgerald or, or something. Um, but um, even in, in high school, um, I had a, a section where we ended up reading Dagon, and I that was one of the first places I was introduced to him. What do you think it is like? It seems like a pulp author. It would be so easy for them to just be lost, as you know, people don't go back and read old pulp right now. So, how did H.P. Lovecraft eventually get accepted or get um, better notoriety? So, there's two really cool things that ended up happening with Lovecraft. Um, one was because he was largely because he was hard up for cash through the majority of his life, ended up taking on just a ton of work, um, either doing revisions or um, working for, like, the, the pulps or so on and so forth. Um, the guy was constantly writing through his career, a career that only really lasted for, I want to say, something to the tune of 20, 25 years. I mean, Lovecraft uh, ended up dying um, in, his, in his 40s, so, I mean, he... Yeah, in his 40s. Um, so, like, did not, like, have, like, this, this giant body of work. Um, so one element was that he was writing pervasively and just cranking out stories for, for quite a time. Um, but he was also doing a lot of revision work. Um, there was even a story that uh, he ended up writing with Harry Houdini, um, where largely, I, I suspect, that not a lot of work was actually done by Houdini, but it was like, let's, let's get my name on this, and um, we'll get the story out there. There's a number of pieces out there that are under the names of other authors um, that Lovecraft ended up uh, doing a lot of the writing on. As he was doing these revisions, what he ended up doing was slipping in a lot of references to his own works. So he had ended up... Uh, between him and another a number of other authors that he was corresponding with, um, you know, folks like Robert E. Howard, uh, August Derleth, uh, Fritz Lieber, I mean, big names in the, uh, in the fantasy world, and who are, or rather that have become giant names uh, in the fantasy world since then, um, were corresponding with him and, and talking and, and so on and so forth. And they were sharing their ideas between each other. So while Lovecraft ended up having in some of his stories references to, like, mysterious places or, like, weird gods or whatever have you, um, and ended up throwing out names like Cthulhu, um, Yig, Haster, so on and so forth, um, many of these were things that he had just created, but then these were also in several cases um, pickups from other works that either he had been in, inspired by or um, the works of uh, his contemporaries. So they would end up sharing different elements of the mythologies that they were creating and putting it into all of these works. So you'd read something by Lovecraft that references uh, Narlathotep, and then you'd go read something by Robert E. Howard or another author writing at about the same time, and they would make this they would make references to these similar deities. And as a writer at the time, or as a reader at the time, who, you know, might not be terribly well versed in history and certainly didn't have the internet or anything, it's like these people that I'm reading keep referencing these ancient deities are are these real? Like the Necronomicon has shown up in like these three books. Is this actually a book? Um, so they were playing this pretty meta game with their with their storytelling that really ended up being pretty insidious by just creating this popularity to it and making it, it pretty pervasive. The other angle on it that ended up also being huge is that after Lovecraft's death, 
August Derleth ended up starting um, a publishing house called Arkham House. Uh, it's a publishing house that still exists today and uh, was largely founded to collect Lovecraft's work and to put them into publication and to keep them in publication. Um, and the seminal collections of Lovecraft's stories, uh, his revisions, even his letters, uh, are still being published and are out there in print from Arkham House even today. So he's been in print since he's since he was writing. Of all the characters you mentioned, I think the one that is clearly the most popular or most associated with Lovecraft is Cthulhu. But why is that? Because from what... In, in talking to other Lovecraft fans, it doesn't seem like Cthulhu was meant to be any more significant than a lot of the other old gods. For that one, I think probably one of the biggest elements of it is is the story that introduced Cthulhu, the, the call of Cthulhu. It's a short story. And um, it's super effective. I mean, as a horror story, it is... It's everything you want it to be. It is legitimately a scary story. Um, first, that's that's kind of that's kind of Lovecraft's blockbuster. I mean, he definitely has a number of other stories that are very popular, like the Mountains of, of Mad the Mountains of Madness is like his his longest story, his novella. Um, super cool, but the Call of Cthulhu is definitely one of his most awesome stories. Um, the strength of that story really helps with that, but then Cthulhu is also a character who is referenced in a, just numerous other works by him, is referenced by numerous other authors, so there's a lot of pointers toward that. Um, then the other element of it is the... I was about to say the character is very distinctive looking. One of Lovecraft's kind of themes um, is that he tries to, he tells you something is undescribable and then goes about describing it. Um, but often is like so vague that it's it's a description where if you told three different artists here's your description, illustrate it, they would give you three things that are just so wildly different. Um, the look for Cthulhu has really, over the last years, and Cthulhu is described as being massive and dragon-like and um, having to have, actually, I, I don't recall if he is ever actually described as having tentacles, but he's just described as this, like, giant horrible thing rising out of the ocean and being monstrous and inscrutable and, and devastating and so on and so forth. Um, the look for him over the last year has really cemented to a point that um, it, it's it's identifiable. I mean, when you go into a game store now, um, if you go into a comic book store, it's it's probably pretty difficult to find one that doesn't have like some Cthulhu plush or, or branded item. Um, for some reason, that character has really gelled over the especially the last decade or two here to the point that it's really become an icon of nerd culture. Do we know what artist first depicted Cthulhu as the giant squid-headed squid monster with the tiny wings and leathery you, skin? I was just thinking about that, and I wish that's something that I had done a little more research into. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it's like it's it's something that when uh, role-playing games got their hands on it, I really feel like that look already exists. Uh, or already existed at the time. I wouldn't be surprised if you could go back to some Arkham House book uh, and find the uh, one of their pieces of cover art or a plate inside that that has something that's pretty similar um, and really inspired artists after that. But uh, that's something I have to look into here. Um, once I once I figure it out, I'll definitely put it in the comments. Now, I again, I only know Cthulhu as the the pop culture icon, and I enjoy him as the pop culture icon. So I know his look, and I know he's associated with madness. What exactly does madness have to do with Cthulhu? So Cthulhu is really tied into with a, a whole, well, with an entire group of, of deities and, and um, monsters and whatnot that collectively uh, are known as the Cthulhu mythos. Um, this is a combination of 
deities and overwhelmingly powerful like creatures from beyond and and so on and so forth um, that either have influences on Earth or even exist on Earth. Cthulhu himself, as he's as he's often described, is not a deity. He's the high priest of another more horrible thing that's been locked away in uh, his his city um, at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and it is sleeping there eternally or, or rather until the, the stars are right. Um, he's in in that in that regard, um, he's really one of the more powerful entities that um, you know that that we that normal people could end up confronting that that you could run into and whatnot. Um, he and all of the the elder gods end up being these entities that rather than like touching people in a like um, in a more religious sense, they've got these like they have minds that are so powerful and intentions that are so alien that like sensitive people or artists or psychics when they're dreaming might have their intelligences brush up against the the dreams of Cthulhu or uh, his his masters, and that even that encounter like fills them with such visions of horror and unscrutable things and just secrets people shouldn't know that it drives them insane. Uh, even just looking at many of the creatures in the, uh, in the Cthulhu mythos are supposed to just be, just your brain can't take it and just totally either flings you into madness or destroys you or so on and so forth. Um, that's really tying into a lot of Lovecraft's themes of the, this cosmic horror of these things that we think we think that we're the, the masters of, of the world or the universe, and it turns out that we don't actually know anything, that we are utterly insignificant, and that the truth out there is so powerful and so such an antithesis to us that even encountering it is, is just going to break our fragile minds. And yet now he's in the Pathfinder role-playing game. <laughs> now he's in Pathfinder. Now he's in. He's been in D and D forever. Now he's a stuffed animal. Um, I have a cheeky <laughs> mug right now that is oh, a Cthulhu. So um, yeah, it, it, it it's it's an interesting sort of sickness that has really pervaded uh, Duran culture, where it's like that would destroy me to know anything else, uh, to know anything about it. Um, let me put my booze in it. It's like, <laughs> okay, cool. But, yeah, Pathfinder um, has really picked up on uh, Cthulhu for, well, for a number of different reasons. First, um, Cthulhu has been a huge part of role-playing games for the last 20, 30 years here. Um, uh, Rob Koontz ended up in Dragon in the in the early days of that magazine, writing an article um, about the Cthulhu mythos in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And from there, uh, the old Deities and Demigods book, or rather the, the early printings of it, um, included the Cthulhu mythos in it. Uh, later printings didn't because they got into legal troubles, but because like. People own Cthulhu these days, so um, that wasn't so good for them, but it, it does show the popularity of it. Um, and then even later, I mean, Chaosium uh, Publishing ended up coming around. They do the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, um, and have really kept that in print for, for edition after edition after edition, and they're that's one of our favorite role-playing games around here. Um, and then Dungeons and Dragons is... Dungeons and Dragons, which is like the... Um, the biggest, and I mean this in a good way, is the biggest thief of cool <laughs> fantasy ideas. Any, like the idea of the entire game has always been: Do you want to play Conan? Do you want to play Falford and the Gray Mouser? Do you want to play a Lovecraft story? You can play that game in D and D. You can play any game you want to play in D and D. Um, always had it as one of its major inspirations. Um, Lovecraft and his work. Pathfinder as being an, an offshoot of that um, has that as well, 
but just we as a, a publishing house and as as creators have always been so obsessed with Lovecraftian things. Like one of our longest running games that isn't Pathfinder is a Call of Cthulhu game. Um, it always ends up slipping into our work, and people end up calling us out on it a lot. It does that. Like, you guys seem to have a lot of Lovecraft stuff in, in this, that, or the other thing. You end up going back to that well a lot. Uh, yeah, it's true, because we really, we really enjoy that stuff. Um, so it's always slipping in when we're always trying to get more and more of it into our products. Now, was Lovecraft strictly a fantasy author? So, Lovecraft really kind of straddles fantasy, science fiction, mystery, gothic horror. Um, one of the things that kind of makes him so interesting is that he kind of started a genre. Um, the Lovecraftian horror is definitely, I mean, you will, you can go out to bookstores now um, and find um, compilations of like the best Lovecraftian horror or the best um, weird fiction, so on and so forth that he really did take so many of these strange horror tropes and kind of melded them together or give, gave them a different spin. Um, I mean, so many of Lovecraft's monsters aren't just old things sleeping in the woods. Sometimes they are, but that they're just as likely to come from outer space or like be an invader from a different dimension um, or be something that's been asleep in the ice for a thousand years, or is from the future, or so on and so forth, but slips into what at the time was the modern world and to menace investigators and heroes and so on and so forth, is really different from, you know, the detective stories of that Poe was writing years before him, or, like, gothic horror stories, um, like Dracula and so forth, so on and so forth. Um, and it's really also being inspired by a lot of weird tales of the time as well, where folks are, at, the science fiction is much more of a sword and planet sort of story, where, like, men with swords are going to Mars and fighting bug princesses and, like, saving, saving nations of strangely colored people with multiple arms. Um, it's really taking a lot of those different elements and giving them its own spin, uh, in creating something that's been influence, influential for thousands of authors since then. Now you said you've got a long-running Call of Cthulhu game, but when I think of Lovecraft, and again, as just someone who kind of knows him tangentially, uh, things do not go well for the protagonists, things do not go well for anyone that tries to get in the way of the old gods. And I know that I've played Arkham, uh, Arkham Horror, and mm -hmm. that game is strange because you either play until the old god shows up, and then it's a completely one-sided fight until you die. Yep. Or you stop the monster from showing up, and that goes against the, the Chekhov's gun idea that if the whole thing's about a monster, the monster should show up. Yes. And yet these are satisfying things in games. How, how, does, that, how does a Lovecraft plot work in a game? Well, first of all, to, to be clear about our game, while it has been running for the longest, I don't think any of us still have the characters we started with. I think every one of us at some point along the, the line ended up um, going insane and then at some point later um, getting killed in some horrible way. I mean, Eric Mona's character um, got, like, just randomly blasted by, like, a serpent person's moon gun. And, I mean, the, the, the rules for this are largely, like, roll 1d6. Six? Person six. One, two, three, four, five, six. You're dead. <laughs> Um, so, like, it, totally merciless in many regards. Um, but that's one of the fun elements of it. I mean, that you get to play these investigators who... Um, it's one of these games where, like, the, the only way to win is not to play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, you're going into this, and you know that you, at your character's creation... Um, they are likely only going to get weaker from this point. They are only going to become more insane, more crippled, less reliable, perhaps more uh, knowledgeable of this, that, or the other thing, but often more knowledgeable of things that they probably shouldn't know to begin with. Um, 
what this ends up, what this has ended up being, then, uh, is that um, James is our game. James Jacobs is our game master for this, um, and James is definitely the biggest Lovecraft fans around here. I tried to get him to come on here today, but he's he's a busy guy. Um, but he's been running this for like what the last three or four years now, uh, and we were able to get through. Um, I believe we played through all of Shadows of Yog sothoth the, the Chaosium uh, adventure. Um, I hope I'm getting that right. But um, we got through all of that, and uh, yeah, by the end of it, I think there was only one person that ended up surviving the final encounter. But that was enough of a person to end up like being the seed for a new group that we put, that put together and expanded from there. So it's not just that the plot is familiar to all the players, but the characters keep resetting. There's actually a thorough line that can be followed through your whole campaign? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chaosium is fantastic at um, telling very moody stories that really can capture um, not, not just the Lovecraft vibe, but even in some cases, um, uh, like the, the idea of, of whole stories. Um, it wasn't Shadows of yogg -Soth -Off. It was Mass of Narlathotep. Um, and at the end of it, you actually end up, or at least in our game, ended up confronting Cthulhu at the end. Um, and yeah, it, it did not go well. But the, the interesting thing about it is that the game is so different from Pathfinder because like in, in games like Pathfinder, Dungeons and Dragons, a lot of other D20 games, the whole, one of the major points is every session you're a little bit better somehow. You've got more experience, you're a little closer to getting to that next threshold, that new power, the, that higher number, more hit points, being able to deal more damage, more, 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 more. Um, with the Lovecraftian themes of, of Chaosium stories, that you do have the elements where it's like, the more you know, you've got more of the story, but that's weighing on you, that's something just out of nowhere could just devour you because these things are so much more powerful. Um, it's a creepy thing, and it's really fun, um, but it, it's such a different form of role-playing. Um, I, I could see that a number of folks who like Pathfinder, who are really into the, the numbers of it, who are really into the progression of it, might not be as satisfied with like, oh no, this is a game where you will, you are going to die in, in some horrible way, and perhaps in some way that you don't have a lot of control over. But it's cool, it's fun, it's, you can only tell sort, certain types of stories with that sort of setup. Um, and those sorts of stories are, are really the, those Lovecraftian ones that Chaosium excels at. So then if Chaosium excels at Lovecraft so well, why so much Lovecraft in Pathfinder? And how does Pathfinder handle it differently? It's so they do it. They do it so well because their whole game is built around telling a Lovecraftian story. Every part of their system, um, heck, the name of their game is called a. It's called Cthulhu. You do not get more Lovecraftian than this. If you want to tell a spot-on, totally down the rabbit hole Lovecraftian game, there's. There's not a, another game that I would recommend before, before Call of Cthulhu. I mean, that's what they do. Um, that said, that's not the only way that you can tell a Lovecraftian story, and it's certainly... Chaosium in Call of Cthulhu does not have a special providence over um, Lovecraftian sort of tales. Um, because we are such big fans of uh, Lovecraftian horror and the monsters from those and the stories and the um, various tropes of it. We really want to have one of the billion different stories you can tell with Pathfinder be the Lovecraftian sort of story. Um, it's, it's in the same way that, I mean, if, in Pathfinder, since we try to make sure that there's space for every type of game, every sort of story you want to tell, um, in the same way that we've got a, a place for jungle adventures, we've got a place for horror tales, we've got a place for science fiction type stuff, we wanted to make sure that there's everything you need in the game to tell Lovecraftian type stories. Um, so, I mean, from the get-go, um, take our bestiary, for example. Our 
bestiary one, just our, our very first one, is the book that I would consider having every monster that you need to play to play a basic fantasy story. So that's got your goblins, that's got your orcs, dragons, so on and so forth. It's like Lovecraftian is, or Lovecraftian horror and those sorts of stories are so core to the role-playing experience for us that, I mean, we were throwing in elements like shug offs. So it's like, we don't want to have a role-playing game that doesn't include a monster as basic as a shug off in it. Um, so it's really been the sort of deal where we want to make sure that, especially since it's so popular and it's such a, a genre that we end up loving, um, that if you want to tell a that sort of story in Pathfinder, you've got everything that you need to do it. I don't believe that there's any like certain type of dice roll or rules mechanic or so on and or so forth that makes your game more Lovecraftian or lo less Lovecraftian. It's largely all about the story that you want to tell um, and you know how much thematics or moodiness that you want to, to roll into it. Um, but if you want to tell a, a Lovecraftian story, if you want to play up the tropes of cosmic horror and the unknowable and mysteries and so on and so forth, we've tried to put into our books and in definitely into certain places in, um, in Galarian, the Pathfinder campaign setting, um, places where it's like, these are the creepy books. These are the unknowable secrets. This is the area where, like, the people aren't quite right. Uh, just so, if you want to have your your dragon slayers, your fighters, your sorcerers experiencing that, like a Lovecraft investigator, you got that. So, if I am a GM who wants to run a very Lovecraftian Pathfinder, where are those places that I should take the players? So. We've got a few different places for it. Um, largely, our place for horror in in Galarian is the is the nation of Ustalov, um, and Ustalov is really one of my babies, one of my pet places. Um, to to pimp the book that's right here, um, Rule of Fear is the the book that I wrote on on the place, and. Um, Ustalov is very much inspired by like Ravenloft and Dracula and, and all those classic things and is divided up into counties and every county really has its theme to it. This is Frankenstein town, this is Dracula country, this is so on and so forth. Well, one of those countries uh, is a uh, region called Versex and it is totally Lovecraft territory. Um, the people are kind of puritanical and don't really like strangers. There's um, a town where nobody quite goes, where the people aren't quite right and have kind of a weird cult. Um, there's like a history of witchcraft. There's um, weird standing stones in a city that really doesn't make sense to exist as a city that just thousands of people have been coming to for forever and there's like weird ruins and so on and so forth. Um, all of these are either Lovecraftian tropes or are echoing ideas from Lovecraft stories. So, so much of Lovecraft's fiction ended up taking place in, in an area that um, I don't think he ever, he, well, which has largely become known as Lovecraft country. It's kind of the Boston, Massachusetts area, and it's this this northwest um, region. It makes references to real places in the country, but then talks about like Innsmouth or Kingsport or uh, a number of other locations. Even references Salem quite frequently as this place where people live here, and there's like this weird history behind it, but there's also uh, there's places you don't quite go, there's places in the countryside that are, that are weird, um, there's places where the people aren't quite right. All of those tropes we've ended up picking up and putting in that, uh, that country, or that county of Ustalov. Beyond that, though, it's weird how much Lovecraft is really influenced, because while I can say that um, Versex is really the place that's 
holds up, that is meant to be a reflection of a lot of Lovecraft's writing, there's so much that we consider fundamental to just really fantasy setting these fantasy settings these days that Lovecraft's responsible, like aliens from outer space, um, creaky things from beyond the stars, that's very Lovecraft. But even like a Darklands or an Underdark type setting, like the idea of like these massive caves where weird things live or cities that have been buried or um, where creator races like are still trapped in the dark and the ice and whatnot, um, these are not just things that were built by Lovecraft, but they showed up in his work so often that, you know, when people build fantasy settings these days, um, the creepy tentacly things that lurk in the dark and, like, have terrible intentions for the, the surface world um, is, is a classic Lovecraftian trope. What about from the player side? Are there any options or any advice you can give to a player who finds himself in a, Love, a Lovecraft-inspired Pathfinder game? Um, expect to die. Um, <laughs> but I don't want to die. <laughs> um, no, the... So most of Lovecraft's heroes are investigators. Um, it was interesting because Lovecraft was a contemporary uh, and of Robert E. Howard, who wrote, like, King Cole and Conan, um, and so on and so forth. And Howard in, ended up doing so much of the classic, like, sword swing barbarian and cults and, and just, like, so, such high fantasy. Um, well, not even high fantasy, but just so many, of, so much of what we consider to be classic fantasy. His... <laughs> Robert E. Howard being, like, a Texan and a man's man and, like, really um, kind of the guy who would, like, like go into fights and would back down from a fight. That's the sort of characters we get from uh, Howard and is really, in many cases, um, the classic fantasy hero. I mean, you don't get to have much more of a, a classic fantasy hero than Conan. He's giant, he's got a sword, nobody can stop him. Ha, ha, ha. Um, a Lovecraftian hero is much more reliant on... He's much more of a detective. He's got a glimpse of something that he doesn't know everything about, that doesn't really fit into the world quite right, that people around him are either uncomfortable with or don't believe him about, and he's on this quest to either figure it out or, or vindicate himself to prove that he's not insane, that that scratching in the walls, he's not just hearing it, that that artifact is actually whispering it to him in the night. Um, he's trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, often the the arc of the Lovecraftian hero is finding out something he shouldn't know, trying to find out more things he shouldn't know, and being destroyed by that knowledge. Um, and that is largely the arc of the um, Call of Cthulhu hero and player. Um, with Pathfinder, we don't try to reinvent the arc of the game. I mean, the, the Pathfinder arc ends up being much more the Robert E. Howard sort of arc, where get get the sword, get more powerful, become the king, so on and so forth. Um, with When we're trying to do Lovecraftian horror, it ends up being less about the heroes becoming secondary to the evil or um, being consumed by the story and ultimately, you know, never having a chance. Um, that's not that's not really what our game's about. Um, but even though we're not going to tell what I think many people would consider a, a, an archetypical Lovecraftian story, that doesn't mean that we can't have elements of it. Um, we've got a number of adventures, like Wake of the Watcher, which you're playing in, um, our adventure, um, Carrion Hill, um, from shore to sea, uh, numerous others. I, in fact, um, strangely enough, even though it's not a horror adventure path, our Shattered Star adventure path, um, just from last year, um, ends up taking. Well, it, it ends up going to Lang, which is a location like an entire plane that was uh, created by Lovecraft. Um, 
we can pull in a lot of these ideas, we can pull in a lot of the monsters, we can pull in the themes of the um, terrible book, like the, the Necronomicon, which in our world is really our book of the damned, um, or just, um, you know, the, these various elements, um, and have your Pathfinder adventure really heavily flavored by um, the same sort of things that you would find in the Lovecraft story. I mean, heck, in the Game Mastery Guide, our, our third book, um, one of the things that we felt really strongly needed to be in here as an option uh, were haunts, just the, the ability to tell a, a creepier, more twisted ghost story, um, and rules for insanity. Um, because that's so central to Lovecraftian story. The guy, the, the character who can't even really trust his own his own mind anymore. Um, you can have these elements and put them onto characters who are doing the classic um, role-playing game progression of like level one, two, three, better, 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 more, 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 um, but still hit them with these vibes um, with with insanity, with monsters that are like beyond description, with these horrible elements, and still really creep them out and make them feel like they're not at home in their own bodies or that they're undermined, or even if the CRs don't change, even if their likelihood of surviving the adventure is not really any different from any other adventure, if you as a game master can make them think that the rules have changed, that they are against the unstoppable, that they are encountering the unknowable, where you're getting a hint of that uh, sort of game without having to completely redo your game system. Yeah, I think that's one of the things about Wake of the Watcher that we're looking forward to. Well, looking forward to and afraid of, because up till now we've we're we're just on the cusp of getting to the insanity, and so up till now in this scenario we've been owning all the encounters. We're we're a very well uh, made group mechanically, but we've never faced anything like insanity rules, and we're all feeling a little vulnerable right now, which is a nice change of pace for our group. Well, I mean, in many ways, a lot of fantasy stories could be considered like pretty much superhero stories. I mean, you're not playing you're not playing you. Like we're not playing ourselves in that. We're not um, limited to like having to rely just on our wits or our physical abilities. We have magic. We can spin a sword or like as our as our characters have magic, we can spin around and like behead all of the goblins. Uh, we can call upon the powers of the gods. Um, they, we're unstoppable. I mean, who can kill that? And even if we die, whatever. I mean, that's how many gold pieces, and even that's problems fixed. Um, like, unstoppable, more often than not. Um, so, so much of the Lovecraft story is that you're not invincible, that there are... You're, that you're not the strongest guy in the block, that just beneath this like thin, thin veneer of reality are things so much t more terrible, that, like, that we're all living in easy mode, and just beyond that are these, these terrible things that are, could just like, to even see would annihilate us. Um, that's something that we really try to get into these stories, and really with something like Wake of the Watcher, which is really played up to be so indulgent of those Lovecraft vibes. I mean, even the town that it takes place in, uh, uh, Ilmarsh, is a direct uh, homage to Innsmouth um, in uh, Lovecraft stories, the, the Shadow over Innsmouth. Um, that it, it's it's just it's meant to be one for one in that case. I mean, the the game is so is so totally meant to be. Hey, you know that story that you know and really love. Here's the adventure that that goes to it, and, and really putting you in that sort of place. Hopefully, without making you feel like you're playing a totally different game. But you know, if you're playing the Carrying Crown Adventure Path, you're already in for like certain horror elements already. So. Let's wrap this up with going back to Cthulhu and in Pathfinder. He's in the Bestiary 4. He's a cover guy on the Bestiary 4. Yep. Now, when you're adapting Cthulhu to Pathfinder, how do you find a compromise between people who want him to just be the over-the-top, madness-inducing, unstoppable monster and the, I don't know if subtle is the right word, but the, the, the more devious creature from the original stories? 
So any time that we do a Pathfinder book, as, as big a fan as we are of, of horror storytelling games, of Call of Cthulhu, of, of role-playing games like that, um, the game we put out is Pathfinder, and our audience wants Pathfinder. And I feel like it would be a disservice, and, and frankly a little off of the rails for what we do and what we're known for, to, to be like, here's all the st stats for Cthulhu, and you can't kill him, and he's going to drive you crazy, and you have no hope. Um, yeah, CR8. It, it's just <laughs> not going to happen. Um, so it's really our, inter it, it's our interpretation of these creatures, of Cthulhu, um, of these themes, through the lens of our game. What this means is that if you want the perfect... Call of Cthulhu experience. If you want to play, if you want to play the story, Call of Cthulhu. Honestly, I would not suggest running that game in Pathfinder. Pathfinder is just a, a different sort of game, has a different sort of vibe, and, in, and is largely about empowering the characters. Um, now, if you do end up want to, wanting to do it in Pathfinder, though, if you want to have those tropes, if you want to have those characters, if you want to really terrify your group, um, and have these Lovecraftian elements into it, here they are. Here's how we would do it. Here's these elements that are already in the rules. Here's these spell-like abilities that work within our rules. Here's these, these parts that you know and you grok. Um, here's how you could take all of the pieces that Pathfinder gives you and build something that is a pretty accurate represent representation of Cthulhu or bowls or the color out of space or whatever have you. Um, is it is it likely to kill you, destroy you, drive you mad, so on and so forth? In many cases, yes, and it gives you those vibes, but um, is it still something that you can encounter as a sword and sorcerer hero, take your spells to, take your weapons to, bring the power of your gods to bear against, and win? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it, it brings that flavor, it brings those themes, it brings it into that world, but it is bringing those elements into the Pathfinder world, not resh reshaping the Pathfinder world to be something that it isn't. All right, well, Wes, I feel better informed now about Lovecraft. I, I don't know when I'll finally find the time to actually read some of it, which is a shame because it's all public domain at this point, so it's, it's not even an investment in money, just in time. But <laughs> yeah. I, I do appreciate... He, Cthulhu is less just the silly plush monster that we all, uh, uh, some of us love and appreciate. Um, before we go, is there anywhere where people can go find more information about Cthulhu, Lovecraft, anything else that you'd like to promote? The two things that I would definitely point people to, actually the three things real quick, is go to chaosium.com, check out their game, um, just call it Cthulhu, awesome game. There's also another game that just came out um, between Call of Cthulhu uh, and uh, Matthias Entertainment called Octoon Cthulhu, which is Cthulhu elements in World War II. Really creepy, really cool, um, and for anybody who likes that kind of like World War II role-playing sort of those themes, that and Cthulhu, two great flavors that go together. Um, I also had a fantastic conversation earlier this year with James Jacobs, Ryan Macklin, and Brandon Hodge, three authors that you might already know for their creepy role-playing vibes and whatnot, at PaizoCon. Um, we did a horror and RPG seminar. We recorded the entire thing, put some pictures and some notes up to it. That's on YouTube right now. If you want to know more about horror in your game, having Lovecraftian vibes, or just want to hear us be clever about creepy stuff for an hour or so, um, go to YouTube and look up horror and RPGs and PaizoCon, and uh, hopefully you'll get a kick out of it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show again, Wes. Well, thanks for having me, Ryan. So now, Will, ask before I end the broadcast, am I to understand your husband is a big G.I. Joe fan? He is indeed. Would he appreciate a, a virtual tour of my room? <laughs> Probably. I see your Cobra uh, yeah. there. Oh, I've got more on the Cobra. I've got an autographed picture of me with Sergeant Slaughter. 
What? That's awesome. Yeah, and that's me as Sergeant Slaughter as a kid. <laughs> oh, that's too cool. Oh, Is that an action yeah. figure back there as well as Sergeant Slaughter? Yeah, yeah. That's a Sergeant Slaughter. He's beating up a Transformer that's based on the Snowcat. But if we turn a little bit to the right, there you can oh, see the Terrodrome. And that's been built into a three-tiered Terrodrome diorama. So <laughs> we've got the motor pool here and then at the bottom, which is going to be very hard to see, unfortunately. Uh, but we've got the fight pit, and it's just a bunch of vipers wow. are surrounding a cage with snake eyes fighting for his life. Cobra <laughs> Commander's watching from up there. That's freaking cool. Yeah, and then we've just got more. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I had no idea you were such an aficionado. That's super cool. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you can look up a show called Fanatical where they just talk with fans. Uh, I am the G.I. Joe guy, or one of the two G.I. Joe oh, guys shit. in that episode. Oh, that's cool. We'll have to check that out. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll point Russ towards it. He'll love it. He um, just cool. got a Scion G at it, fancy sporty car um, that he's like totally repainted black and has Cobra stickers on it, and he's going nice. to get the license plate um, Hiss. Nice. Um, so he's trying to make it the, look as much like a Cobra Hiss as he can. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> What's he going to beyond getting the, the logo in black? What's he going to do? Put a turret on it? <laughs> it's, it's it is getting close to that. He is not going to go that far, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, he is definitely sporting it out in that particularly nerdy direction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, I'm going to end the broadcast now.